Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the third webinar of our associate member webinar series, Recognizing and Managing the Embodied Carbon of Concrete, presented to us today by Master Builder Solutions. So my name is Camille Richet, and I'm going to be your facilitator today. Uh, so I'm the office manager with Concrete Ontario, uh, and I'm also joined by Oliver Zhao, our technical services engineer, who is going to be helping us out with the uh, question and answer portion later on and just running through the webinar. I'm very excited to give you all a chance to connect with uh, some of our associate members and learn more about some of the products and services that they specialize in and the opportunities that they present to the concrete industry. I wanted to just quickly go over, sorry, there's Oliver. I'm not moving through my slides very well here. I uh, just wanted to go over some housekeeping rules quickly. So it'll be approximately a 40 minute webinar with a short question and answer period at the end, followed by a Kahoot pop quiz round. Uh, all of the participants are muted. So if you do have any questions, if you can please enter them in the questions pane in your GoToWebinar um, options. And the webinar will be recorded and posted on the Concrete Ontario website along with a PDF copy of the presentation. So if there's any parts you'd like to reference or anything you missed or any colleagues you want to recommend it to, it will be available for you there in the next few days. So I'd like to introduce our presenters. Today uh, joining us we have uh, Dr. Shervan Kahan. Dr. Shervan Kahan is based out of Toronto and has over 20 years of experience in the cement manufacturing and ready mix concrete industries. Van has been with Master Builder Solutions for over eight years and is responsible for providing technical leadership and strategic guidance in the marketing of admixtures and high performance concrete technology in Canada. And Trevan is also a professional engineer of Ontario. And we also have David Green with us today. David Green is responsible for the management, development, and implementation of various strategic and applied sustainability initiatives for Master Builder Solutions worldwide. In this role, David leads the application of sustainable construction solutions using science-based sustainability models and quantification tools supporting the construction value chain. David is and always has been actively involved in various sustainability committees with the ASTM, USGBC, WELL, and ACC, in addition to the PCR committees for concrete and cement. He has over 25 years of engineering, manufacturing, and operations management experience and is accredited by the Green Building Certification Institute as a certif and certified as a Green Globes professional. So thank you both so much for joining us today. Uh, David, at this point, I'm going to hand things over to you. Let's make sure you've got controls here. Very good. Thank you, Camille. And Shervin and I definitely appreciate the introduction and everyone's um, attendance today and we're going to provide some information for you and don't hesitate to ask questions in um, the question and answer or chat box um, moving forward. So let's begin with what our objectives are today um, focused on why carbon and CO2 is an issue within the industry um, specifically but on a global basis. The difference between embodied and operational carbon uh, difference in um, build, building materials and their CO2 impact relative to construction, some of the components of concrete and their emissions associated with those, some of the options and opportunities to reduce concrete both today um, and through innovations and future opportunities, a pathway that can be used to move toward net zero in terms of carbon emissions, specifically in the concrete product and concrete industry, some of the initiatives that are driving a focus on lower embodied carbon from both the market and regulatory perspective, and then a success story um, and some future opportunities, and then we'll have some time for some questions and answers. So why is carbon or CO2 an issue in the marketplace or in industry in general? Um, the main sources of CO2 emissions are respiration from humans and animals, the decomposition of organic materials um, that naturally occurs in the environment and the combustion of fossil fuels. Now, obviously, we don't want to restrict respiration. Um, we're not going to do a whole lot about organic decomposition. So our focus and our opportunity is, is in managing uh, the combustion of fossil fuels and to reduce the impact from the CO2 emissions. 
But what does CO2 do and why is it a concern? Well, it, it actually traps solar heat or energy in the atmosphere, um, which will normally escape. And it creates a blanket, a blanket effect around the earth. And so that blanket then traps that type of heat and actually warms the earth. And some of the effects that have been noted or defined or described um, are impacts on weather, which then negatively or positively affect agriculture, um, which obviously is a mainstay of human beings and, and agriculture. Um, and then an impact on ocean levels and rising and lowering of ocean levels around the world and what impact that will have on coastal regions. So over the years, and this goes all the way back obviously to 1750, but since about 1940, um, you can see that there has been a pretty significant increase in not only the um, concentration of CO2, which is highlighted in the magenta or pink type line, but also in the amount of emissions associated with CO2. Um, and as that obviously can be defined with industrialization and um, the development of countries around the world, we have to recognize that continued climb in CO2 will be a concern moving forward. And so we have to take approaches today that can begin to curb that continuous rise um, as we know the impacts associated with the continuous growth of CO2 emissions. So in the construction industry and in, in all product development in general, there are two types of CO2 or carbon that are quantified or measured relative to products. And that's embodied carbon and operational carbon. The embodied carbon is associated with the emissions from manufacturing and transportation and the installation, in this case, of materials into a building or a structure. Whereas the operational carbon are the emissions associated with the consumption of energy during the use phase of that building or structure. And so um, when we differentiate those two, it allows us to see where our potential opportunities are to reduce both operational and or embodied carbon um, for the improvement of the manufacturing sector. And so another way to look at it from a life cycle perspective is that embodied carbon is associated with really a cradle to gate analysis, which is from the raw material extraction through the manufacturing of the building materials. Now, a cradle to grave analysis could be done for a carbon footprint, which would be the entire life cycle of the product or solution. But primarily, we're looking at the embodied carbon element, and I'll show you why momentarily. On the left hand side, and this pie chart was developed in 2000, based on data from 2017, you can see that the operations associated with buildings and the materials in construction are about 39% of our global CO2 emissions. Now, if we break just those two numbers down, we get about a 72 to 28% um, variance between operational carbon or CO2 emissions and material um, carbon or embodied carbon. If you look to the right bar chart, those are the projections for 2050, where the difference between those two, rather than being a 72-28 split, is closer to a 49-51% split. And the reason for that is because of the last decade or so, there's been a significant focus on lowering energy consumption um, in the use of a building or structure with improved insulation or glazing systems, HVAC systems, et cetera and been much less attention on the embodied carbon associated with the materials that go into the building or structure. And so the projections are that if nothing is done, that they'll almost be equivalent by 2050. And so now is our opportunity um, as an industry to focus on the embodied carbon component and shrink its potential impact in the next 30 years. So where is the embodied carbon associated with buildings and structures? So on the left-hand side, you'll see by division that the largest contributors to global warming potential are finishes and concrete. And they make up more than 50% of the global warming potential um, associated with those divisions. On the right-hand side, you'll see it broken down um, into products. And so the predominant contributors are walls and ceilings, roofs and floors, which for the most part makes sense because that's really the structural elements associated with the building or structure. Um, and those components are generally steel, wood, and concrete, 
um, in large quantities, and so they most likely would contribute to the highest potential global warming impact. Now, what's interesting is that concrete, as you may know, is the most widely used man-made material in the world. And so just based on a volume perspective, the CO2 contribution associated with concrete is very, very high. And that's partially associated with the calcining impact in cement. Uh, but based on the volume, it's a significant contributor to global warming potential. But on a unit basis, if we look at it and recognize how concrete is produced and the raw materials that go into it, um, it is fairly small. Um, we know that we can use recycled materials in the development of concrete. Um, as well as other supplementary cementitious materials. And concrete at the end of life can be recycled and reused. And so it does have significant benefits. It's very durable, it's very resilient. Um, and so it's not really time to cast off concrete as a good construction material as it does have some sustainable attributes, but it's our opportunity to evaluate what are the largest contributors and see if we can make better um, equal or better solutions in concrete with lower environmental burdens. So here's a diagram that shows about opportunities to reduce carbon reduction or carbon impacts. Um, obviously, if we build nothing, then there's no impact on new construction. Um, and if we build less, there's obviously a smaller impact on new construction. But if we're going to build new, we have to build in a state of being clever. And from a concrete perspective, it means that we really need to be um, involved in the early development or design of a project so that all the players associated with that concrete product can be at the table. Um, if we're only focused on lowering embodied carbon, what are the impacts on durability or resilience? What are the impacts on pumping and placing of that material, strength gain, et cetera? So we have to be cognizant. And if we ask all those questions up front early in the design phase, we have a greater opportunity to develop the most sustainable option that fulfills all the requirements of each of the organizations or groups um, throughout the value chain. So life cycle assessment is used to quantify embodied carbon and other environmental burdens associated with a product or a solution. It's essentially environmental accounting. You wanna look at it in that perspective. Um, and a life cycle assessment then can be used to develop spe specific embodied carbon, partial carbon footprints, full carbon footprints, or a full gamut of environmental burdens associated with, for example, an EPD. Again, the embodied carbon component is just the blue portion of the arrow on the right, or the blue arrow on the right hand side, which is the raw material acquisition, the transportation and manufacturing of the product. So there's a lot of acronyms and letters that are used in life cycle assessment. The, but the intent of this, um, if you want to call it a dartboard, is to see how they fit together. And a life cycle inventory is the beginning component. And that's an inventory of inputs um, associated with energy and materials and outputs associated with emissions such as solid waste, air emissions, and water emissions. So those are individual inventories of individual products that would go into, for example, a cubic meter of concrete. Those individual inventories are consolidated into a life cycle assessment. Part of that life cycle inventory, or the full life cycle inventory, and part of that life cycle assessment is used to create the carbon footprint. And a component of the overall carbon footprint is the element of embodied carbon. So a life cycle inventory developed into a life cycle assessment is what is needed to create the results for embodied carbon. And embodied carbon is a component of an environmental product declaration, which reports more constituents or impacts from an environmental perspective. But as you may be aware, the industry is significantly focused on the impacts of embodied carbon primarily. And so this just gives you an idea of A, how it's created, but B, where it comes from. So the EPD is the reporting mechanism or communication channel that is validated to document and report the embodied carbon component. An EPD or an environmental product declaration um, requires a number of steps. Essentially, it's an environmental label of a product or a solution. 
and it's really only reporting environmental burden. So if you were to consider this a um, result for sustainability, you would be missing the economic component as well as the social indicator um, element. So this is strictly an environmental report. An EPD is owned by the producer. It's based on publicly available rules, which are called product category rules. Again, it's not a comparison. So an EPD does not compare multiple products. It's a single indicator of one product or a family of products. Um, it can take quite a bit of time to develop one so that if you're interested in creating EPDs, you're gonna need to do some homework and understand that that time frame needs to be considered, especially if you are considering um, an approach for a particular project. It will generally require a validation from a third party, um, and that third party validation will be um, require some costs associated with that. The EPD must be registered with a program operator for it to be publicly available. That also then allows it to be used for uh, bid submittals. And again, it can represent a product, a group of products. It can represent products from a single plant or products from multiple plants. So you have a lot of variations that can be created through an EPD, and it's best to do the homework to figure out what your best options are for future opportunities. So a EPD is developed from a set of rules. It requires that life cycle assessment to be developed to report the results, and the results are communicated through the formal document, which is third-party validated. If you're gonna create an EPD, it's important to get started, um, but you can do a lot of the work in advance so that when you would do a, approach a practitioner or a developer of EPDs, you can have some information um, and be prepared for the questions that you're going to get, such as how many products are you going to develop EPDs for? Um, which specific mix designs would you consider for EPD development? And do you know which are the more sustainable or options that have the lowest embodied carbon associated with them? Collect your annual utilities associated with your plant operations. That would include um, any of the natural gas or propane or um, electricity, consumption on an annual basis for your facility because what's reported is almost what's considered an efficiency number, which is the utilities per cubic meter of concrete produced for the operation. Um, you'll need information on your raw materials or your supplier products, their locations, uh, the distances that they transport the materials to your producer site and the mode of transportation that's used, the waste disposal associated with your plant or operation, and waste disposal are materials that are removed from the site, the production plant. So, for example, non-hazardous waste that maintains or remains on the production facility does not have to be included. And then your annual water consumption um, relative to uh, the operation itself. You're going to need to find a life cycle practitioner, a developer of EPDs, and then a program operator. And recognize that any um, affiliated or approved program operator can review and approve an EPD, so it does not have to be isolated to a single program operator that you may be familiar with. You can do some homework relative to that, um, perhaps from a cost perspective you like to do that, or perhaps more aligned with the industry um, as the predominant program operator. What needs to be considered from a concrete producer perspective is that if we're only looking at embodied carbon, we have to be careful that we are not what we call burden shifting um, or only focused on one indicator and neglecting the potential impacts further on down uh, either the value chain or the life of the project. As you can see here, predominantly um, foundations and structures have a very long lifetime and those are the expectations for concrete in particular. Um, but if we only focus on the embodied carbon element, we have to still make sure that we include the resilience and the durability factors um, and the full life cycle aspects of a product. Not only that, but the burden shifting potential in, say for example, if your lower embodied carbon um, product requires more water or generates more acidification potential, is that the right solution? So. Um, a single indicator can be lead to 
um, inappropriate decision making. So one should always consider all the factors that would be included in an environmental product, product declaration over and just above embodied carbon. So be aware, be mindful, be smart. Um, remember not to just focus on a single indicator, but consider the durability and the resiliency, the cost to produce that product or solution, other environmental indicators that may impact the results, the time for construction, pumping, placing, finishing, are those affected by a lower embodied carbon result? Um, keep those in mind and make sure that everyone along the value chain is informed and educated, and that's why it's critical to be involved early in the design phase. So overall decisions should be based on the whole picture. And once we understand what the whole picture is, we can see what may be below the surface and make better decisions. At this point, I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Shervin Khanna, who will take us through the balance of the presentation. And also don't forget to provide any questions that you may have in the chat or question box. So Shervin, I will pass it over to you. Great, thank you, David. And again, welcome everyone. Um, so let's start to get into embodied carbon more specifically uh, with respect to concrete and its material components. The terms cement and concrete are often used interchangeably. Um, however, concrete is the finished material you see in roads, sidewalks, beams, slabs, and other similar elements. Cement is the binder that makes concrete possible. And so concrete consists of five main components. Those include cement, stone, sand, water, and admixtures. And while Portland cement only consists of 7 to 15% of a concrete's total volume, it is responsible for up to 95% of the carbon emissions. So yes, there's additional carbon associated with the other concrete materials, uh, including aggregate water and admixtures. However, the, the carbon dioxide emissions associated from these materials are much lower than that associated with Portland cement. Cement and concrete can be traced back to ancient Roman times. So it has been around for a, a long, long time and has been a key building material globally since that period. Uh, modern Portland cement was invented in 1824 in England, and the first Portland cement manufactured in Canada was just before 1900. So while there have been many technical innovations since then, the basic process of cement production remains the same. Um, components including limestone, iron, silica, and alumina are quarried from the ground, then crushed and ground to a powder, and then it heated uh, in a kiln to approximately 1400 degrees Celsius to produce clinker. Uh, these are the golf uh, ball sized stones you see on the right uh, of the screen that are coming out of the kiln. Clinker is then ground with limestone and gypsum to make Portland cement, the key binder in concrete. So carbon emissions from cement is a result of both the fuel combustion as well as the process related emissions. So on this slide um, is a cement kiln schematic. Um, and so the manufacture of cement produces approximately 0 0.9 kilograms of carbon dioxide for every kilogram of cement. So uh, first, uh, approximately 50% of the carbon dioxide emissions are from the chemical process related to creating clinker. And that's the conversion of limestone to calcium oxide uh, and carbon dioxide. And second, approximately 40% of the carbon dioxide emissions are associated with fuel combustion and burning the raw materials to a temperature of 1400 degrees uh, Celsius. And lastly, uh, approximately 10% of the carbon dioxide emissions are associated with grinding the clinker in, in a finish mill typically um, to the fine uh, powder of cement. So what can we do as an industry to reduce embodied carbon and concrete? And there are two key areas uh, to focus on. And the first is to reduce the carbon associated with the production of Portland cement. And as you saw, about 95% of the carbon emissions from concrete are directly related to uh, cement. So cement producers around the world are, are working on solutions actively to reduce the carbon in cement. Um, and some of these include uh, the utilization of lower carbon footprint fuels, such as transitioning from coal to natural gas. Uh, the second is reducing the clinker to cement ratio, and that has been with the introduction of uh, new Portland limestone cements. And these Portland limestone cements provide equivalent performance uh, to 
100% Portland cement with generally 10 to 15% less carbon. And lastly, um, the industry is looking at deploying innovative carbon capture technologies. And that would include carbon capture at the point of clinker production, which would provide the greatest impact in carbon reduction emissions. So these are very complex and very expensive systems to implement uh, and ongoing. The second area to focus on is concrete production. Uh, and today we have many options that can reduce uh, the carbon dioxide by up to uh, 70%. And these are with commercially available technologies today. So let's walk through some of these options. Uh, first is managing the water content. And this can have a huge impact on the carbon footprint of a given concrete mixture. You can reduce uh, and control water content by utilizing water reducing admixtures or high range water reducers. Next are new strength enhancing admixtures that provide the ability to reduce cement content and have higher levels of supplementary cementitious materials while achieving equivalent strength performance. Next is including supplementary cementitious materials such as slag, fly ash, that provide uh, the greatest ability to reduce the cement content and lowering the embodied carbon and concrete. We've already spoken uh, a little bit about the utilization of lower carbon cements, such as Portland limestone uh, as an option. Uh, the industry is also looking at utilization of alternate uh, binders that have lower carbon footprints, uh, such as Solidia. Um, and producers can include recycled aggregates, which lower carbon and also divert material from the waste stream. And there are also new and commercially available carbon sequestration, sequestration and carbon offset technologies being explored. Lastly, concrete producers can focus on the carbon directly associated with the production and delivery of concrete, uh, such as lowering carbon footprint fuels in ready mix concrete trucks. And this would be by transitioning a, a fleet of ready mix trucks from diesel to compressed natural gas. So the concrete options that I just covered uh, allow producers to achieve up to 70% embodied carbon reduction with commercially available technologies that provide equivalent performance. It is important to understand that a single technology is not going to get us to net zero and that using multiple, uh, multiple technologies uh, will provide the greatest option for embodied carbon reduction. A recent option to reduce embodied carbon in concrete uh, mixes is the inclusion of strength enhancing admixtures. And, and Master Builder Solutions has a proprietary admixture called Master Exceed. And the inclusion of Master Exceed provides the ability to reduce the embodied carbon in a typical concrete mix by up to, uh, in a range of five to 20%. So Master Exceed increases cement hydration by introducing millions of calcium silicate hydrates or CSH nanoparticles in the concrete mix. And this admixture improves early and late age strength development and provides the ability to increase the use of supplemental cementitious materials. Uh, Master Exceed uh, improves concrete performance and allows for cement reduction uh, of embodied carbon emissions in concrete. <clears throat> and if you're interested in exploring uh, more about this technology, there is a, a link to a video that's on the screen here um, that shows how uh, the Master Exceed technology works. But to give you some indication on the performance mechanism, we can review it uh, briefly. Um, on the right hand side is a grain of sand uh, of the screen and on the left are two gray cement uh, grains. And with the introduction of water, uh, cement hydration will begin. And Master Exceed introduces the, the calcium silicate hydrates, these nanoparticles, uh, into the matrix. And these act as nucleation sites which improve uh, the cement hydration. So the calcium silicate hydrate crystals grow from both the cement gain and, and CSH nanoparticles, which increases the strength of concrete. So Master Exceed uh, provides the ability to reduce the embodied carbon in concrete mixes, as mentioned, by in a range of five to 20%. So let's talk about the path towards net zero embodied carbon in concrete. Um, there are several options that allow um, to as much as 70% embodied carbon reduction with commercially available technologies that provide equivalent concrete performance. 
So what we'll do is we'll walk through uh, the steps uh, to achieve approximately 50% reduction today. So on the left, you see uh, a reference mix. It's a 34 MPA concrete mix. And we'll assume it has an embodied current concrete, uh, um, assuming 100% Portland cement. And the uh, first is the inclusion of a water uh, inclusion of a water reducing admixture or a high range water reducing admixture. And this would reduce the embodied carbon by up to 15%. Next is the utilization of supplemental cementitious materials, uh, such as slag or fly ash. And this can provide an additional 25% 25 uh, reduction in embodied carbon. Uh, with the inclusion of strength enhancing admixtures such as Master Exceed, this would provide an additional 10% reduction in embodied carbon. So by, by combining these three technologies, you can have 50% reduction in embodied carbon. And as we move towards net zero concrete, it will require new technologies such as carbon capture at the point of cement production or the use of carbon offset technologies. So what we would like to do now is, is to cover at somewhat a high level some of the forces driving the shift towards initiatives around reduction of carbon and concrete and why this is becoming an important topic for our industry. And, and we place these driving uh, forces into two buckets. And the first bucket is market demand. Now, the goal for uh, lowering embodied carbon and concrete is being led by owners who have a strategic focus. And on the lower portion of this slide are some examples of large well-known companies that have recently included net zero embodied carbon goals in their construction specifications across North America. The second bucket is regulatory. And the first point to, to highlight within this bucket is that depending on the region uh, you are in, we're beginning to see the inclusion of embodied carbon reduction in building codes at the federal, provincial, and municipal level. Secondly, governments at different levels are also beginning to introduce carbon reduction goals in projects funded by tax dollars, which are typically infrastructure projects. Uh, some examples of this are hospitals, bridges, and schools. And so the topic of specification is very important when we are referring to embodied carbon, uh, especially for the architects and engineers on the call. Uh, it's very important to understand that the carbon reduction goals uh, need to be in alignment with a specification document. So you want to make sure that there are opportunities within a specification to reduce the amount of cement and also the, include uh, the potential use of uh, supplemental cementitious materials strength enhancing admixtures and other carbon reduction technologies. So carbon dioxide footprint is currently not a very common discussion during the mixed design optimization stage. So significant change is required. Uh, the specification traditionally would have minimum cement contents as an example, or would have limitations on the use of supplementary cementitious materials. So as mentioned, it's important that we allow flexibility uh, ideally, we want to have the industry move towards specifying concrete performance and let the contractor and concrete producer determine what is the best um, option for the mix uh, and the application. So with that, specifications should also allow for flexibility towards technologies like Master Exceed uh, to enhance the opportunity for embodied carbon reduction in concrete mixes. So now what we'll do is we'll walk through a recommended methodology for a specification of a low embodied concrete carbon uh, concrete mix. Um, it's important to note that as we walk through some of these steps, uh, there should be alignment as mentioned, especially at the early stages between the performance of the concrete and the carbon reduction goals. So concrete is a, a dynamic material and performance can vary depending on availability of regional materials, performance of those regional materials, constructability, time of year, scheduling, placement techniques required, and several other important parameters. So along with these parameters, the, the, the technologies that are available to achieve lower embodied carbon are quickly evolving and therefore dynamic. So the first step would be for an owner to decide what the embodied carbon goal would be for that project. Um, the second step is for the engineer and architect uh, to consult uh, with master builder solutions for the concrete portion of the project or other stakeholders. And our team uh, from master builders perspective has a local expertise as well as global support for engineering and quantification 
of the sustainability project goals. Uh, the third step would be for all stakeholders to meet and align for concrete performance and carbon reduction goals. Um, critical decisions uh, often will uh, on concrete need to be made early on for embodied carbon reduction because the resultant concrete will impact structural requirements for the engineer, contractor demands for placement uh, and finishing and architectural finishes as well. Um, in the fourth step and after these meetings, there is a clear alignment on the performance and carbon reduction goals. Now the balance between performance, carbon reduction uh, and constructability is one that will be critical for the producers, contractors, uh, engineers and architects. So at this stage is where we, we would recommend a performance-based concrete specification be created. A fifth step would be for um, the, the local producers to optimize the concrete mix for performance and the carbon dioxide uh, reduction project goal. The next step would be for architects and engineers to approve the parameters for design um, and then uh, we would work with our producers to provide an environmental product declaration that would validate the concrete meeting the carbon reduction goals. And we're also able to provide other quantification metrics that may be needed for the project. And the final step would be uh, for verification that the project actually meets the targets that were outlined at the beginning of, of the project. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to highlight a recent project. Uh, it's an award-winning project uh, that was built on the waterfront in Toronto. It is a 36-story high-rise condominium building called Pier 27. And the challenge in this project was to achieve high early compressive and ultimate strengths while also maintaining concrete mixtures that were suitable for constructability while also meeting schedule uh, requirements as well as uh, placement requirements. So the solution was to utilize the master exceed uh, admixture for performance as well as embodied carbon reduction. So some of the things we wanted to highlight um, that without master exceed admixture, the options to achieve the performance concrete would have required either higher uh, cement contents or usage of a high early cement, uh, both of which would have significantly increased the embodied carbon content of the baseline mix. So because of the ease of constructability in the concrete, Using Master Exceed, the contractor was also able to eliminate other carbon intensive practices such as uh, heating the concrete forms. So for this project, Master Exceed received a material development and an innovation award uh, from Concrete Ontario. Um, what we'd also like to highlight is that for those interested in other um, educational or information uh, seminars, uh, related to master builders and, and industry um, uh, trends and and uh, topics. Uh, master Builder Sol Solutions has uh, Let's Talk Concrete seminar series developed. And it's on various topics and each session is on a Wednesday at 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. So you can see on the schedule there are upcoming topics um, listed and uh, the next session is March 24th entitled Concrete Cracking. So if you're interested in, in um, some of these topics and sessions, please feel free to register for them. Um, and for questions later, um, you can reach out to myself or David. And I think that concludes our session. So thank you very much for joining us. And I'll pass the, the floor back to um, Oliver and Camille. We'll be happy to take your questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Shervan, and thank you, David. Um, yeah, we are gonna bug you to answer some questions now. So Oliver, I will uh, pass things over to you with our questions. Awesome, thank you, Camille. Uh, we got a few questions in. Uh, maybe let's start with a more generic question uh, from Joe. Uh, what concrete is used in LEED certified building? I think that's, if I can, jump in here um it's really not a specific design concrete in a lead building what they're looking for is the reporting mechanism associated with the concrete itself from an environmental or human health perspective and so regardless of the type of concrete the key components to acquire lead credits or points are environmental product declarations 
which detail or label that specific mix design um, and or what are called uh, manufacturing transparency documents, also known as HPDs, health product declarations or cradle to cradle um, certifications to evaluate the human health constituents associated with the development of a particular product. And so um, there's not a specific concrete mix that is required. Um, it can be any concrete mix for any type of a project, but the key will be to be able to quantify the environmental and or human health um, aspects with that concrete mix design. Awesome, that's perfect. Um, just a kind of follow-up question to that. Um, can I set common goals for each mix design or should a project average be used? Uh, that's an excellent question. And so I would say that uh, many times from a project perspective, the objective from the, whether it's a consultant, architect, owner, developer, whatever, is looking for lower embodied carbon for the entire project. And therefore each of the constituents will um, be an additive component for the final result. So if the project is under some guidelines to reduce embodied carbon from a average building or structure by X percent, the concrete component is probably gonna play a pretty significant role because of its um, quantity, its volume and its embodied carbon level. Um, as was shown in some of the, the charts previously that um, concrete and finishes are the from um, from the perspective of construction are the largest suppliers of global warming potential. Now, sometimes um, structural engineers will get a little more detailed and provide baseline information for embodied carbon on concrete specifically um, and or require the producer to provide an EPD that designates the level of embodied carbon associated with their mix design. Um, I'm a firm believer that you always want to be as transparent, A, in your information, um, but as product specific as you can relative to your mix designs, uh, because it affords you the best opportunity to convey information about your innovations or your solutions in support of the overall objectives. Okay, great. Um, wow, we've got a few more questions here. Um, do you have any tools to assist in quantifying the CO2 of current mix design? So there are tools um, that you can search for on the web that are generally called embodied carbon calculators or embodied carbon estimators. Um, we do have our own tool that we utilize with customers for um, a quick overview of a comparison of embodied carbon associated with different mix designs so that uh, before one gets too far down the um, development, they can see if it's going to perhaps meet a requirement within a project um, or be an improvement over an existing mix design that they may consider um, for submittal. If it needs to go further where it has to be a validated um, embodied carbon result or any environmental burden result, you're going to have to take it to the next step of creating a life cycle assessment associated with that cubic meter of concrete. And then ultimately, if it's for a submittal, most times it will require an environmental product declaration. Um, the development of both of those requires databases um, that are publicly available but are quite expensive um, or the use of a consultant or um, life cycle practitioner to help you in creating that documentation that can be further validated and utilized for submittals. If you're looking for just general information on embodied carbon results of a concrete mix that you currently have, I would recommend um, searching the web for an embodied carbon concrete calculator and utilize your mix design to begin evaluating the results and see where you're at. Um, remember that I wouldn't use the results as definitive numbers that um, you would adhere to, but they can give you a barometer um, or an indicator of where you're at. And if you can compare two or more mixed designs, you can see what the relative improvement is between those alternatives. 
Awesome. Thank you, David. Uh, and uh, Concrete Ontario does also have on our website uh, in an industry average EPD uh, and also a calculator that's uh, available uh, on our website. Um, just to uh, give the question to Dr. Shervan, but because, before that, I just want to address a few similar questions that's being asked here. Um, so after today's webinar, both the slide and the video recording of this presentation will be posted on our website uh, under the webinar session. Uh, that will take uh, us a few days, but you will be provided a link with a follow-up uh, uh, email from your registration. Okay, so turning to Dr. Shervan, uh, we will see more use of recycled materials in concrete, uh, such as plastic with regards to building codes. Interesting question. Yeah, it is an interesting question. I think um, I think uh, we're seeing a trend, in, and certainly uh, as we were mentioning, the, the market demand and the regulatory demand um, it seems to be that that the path towards uh, the net zero uh, embodied carbon reduction is, is very strong. And so th with this momentum, um, where there has been some hesitation for recycled materials, there will be need to be more focus in this regard. So I, I think um, uh, necessity is the, is the is the mention is, is the driver for inv innovations and, and and certainly. Um, a shift towards the recycled materials, uh, unless there are some other technologies that are are involved in terms of the carbon reduction that that makes a significant incremental. Um, we talked a little bit about the, during the presentation about multiple use of technologies, and certainly recycled materials it is a component of that. Thank you. Uh, next question regarding SEM use uh, and uh, uh, limestone replacement. So for GOL use, does this allow for a lower embodied carbon measure in concrete? I think that was mentioned, but uh, maybe you want to go into a little bit more detail. Well, I'll just talk a little bit about the presentation and how we used a reference mix, and then David maybe can can talk a little bit about from the, the quantification side. But uh, in during the presentation, we referenced uh, the mix that was 100% Portland cement, and and so then we introduced the different uh, steps towards uh, reducing the carbon. But David, maybe from your perspective in terms of quantification and EPD. I think what you'll see is that um, as more blended cements are developed and created, um, that the embodied carbon associated with the concrete mix design will go down based on the cement. Um, it's all driven by the Portland cement um, or OPC content or clinker factor that's going to be in the cement as well as the concrete mix design, um, as that's the largest contributor. And I think in the presentation it showed that about 90 to 95 percent of the global warming potential emissions in a cubic meter of concrete um, are associated with that cement content. And so any type of blended cement um, or any opportunities to reduce that Portland cement content in the mix design will definitely drive lower embodied carbon results. Okay, great, thank you. Next question. Uh, what do you do when the construction schedule conflicts with carbon reduction goals? An excellent question. And um, that is the trade-off scenario associated with what is really sustainability. Um, there is no perfectly sustainable product. Products are only more sustainable than an alternative. And in this case, what you're looking at is um, providing all the details associated with Lower embodied carbon A of X percent um, may require more time to gain strength. And so that could slow down um, the construction timeframe. Um, that's why it's very important to evaluate concrete mix designs early on in the design stage so that all the players are at the table. And so one can make an educated decision based on if we want to lower embodied carbon by X percent, what's the effect on the construction time? 
which includes pumping placement finishing. Um, and everybody has to come to the same conclusion and very, be very comfortable with those decisions that are made because there are balances, trade-offs, and offsets, and those need to be considered in any decision making. That's great. Um, so what are the cost savings or cost premiums associated with the different measures on the path to net zero uh, embodied carbon concrete? Boy, that's a, I'm not sure there's a definitive answer to that question. Um, so each one of those contributors to embodied carbon are going to have a cost associated with them. Each of the raw materials that goes into your cubic meter of concrete is going to have a cost associated with it. And if your alternative um, supplementary cementitious materials are able to be delivered at a lower cost than cement, then there is an opportunity there, but perhaps they're not due to transportation distances or current pricing in the marketplace. Um, you know, it, it kind of boils down to each of those changes may have a favorable impact, may cost more, um, may cost less um, as you drive down those numbers. So once again, that goes to the balancing of the overall aspect of sustainability where we're looking at environmental improvement, but we have to also consider that the economic solutions. Um, and from a pure sustainability standpoint, the most environmentally perfect solution may be the most cost um, or the most expensive alternative. And so if that's the case and no one wants to buy it, then it's not really a more sustainable solution. And so you have to back off and see what the trade-offs are associated with those. As was mentioned in the presentation, the most expensive component to get to net zero is going to be those final 50% of reduction, which is going to be associated with new innovations and in carbon capture, et cetera. Um, but the first 50% can be um, developed and introduced using today's solutions that are available. But yes, cost is a component that has to be considered when looking at the embodied carbon reductions and decisions have to be made at times as to whether um, the owner would be willing to spend some more dollars on that uh, or would rather increase the embodied carbon impact um, at a lower cost. So all those things, um, I hate to repeat it again, but all those things should be considered in the early design stages of any project. And when they come out to the top, then we have much less much fewer problems um, when we get into construction. But, and, and I think also along with that uh, is the importance of having these discussions at the uh, beginning stages of optimizing the concrete mix to ensure that the constructability as well as the, the performance of as a life cycle structure, um, that they're, they're aligned. Um, certainly um, with Master Exceed, uh, it, it's a strength enhancing uh, admixture but it, it doesn't um, delay the setting time or slow down the constructability. So, so some of these technologies um, can be utilized and they don't impact or can actually be used to accelerate um, the, the construction uh, schedule. So certainly at the beginning of, this, of the project, it's very important to have these discussions um, so that um, the cost can be, if there is any implications on cost, it can be mitigated uh, and, and at the beginning of the project. Awesome, that's great. Thank you, guys. Um, just to uh, respect the schedule and the time, um, if you guys have uh, any uh, more question, any unanswered question, uh, please free to reach out to us, David and Dr. Shervan. Uh, now I'm going to hand back to Camille for our uh, last component, which is a quick quiz. Camille. Thanks, Oliver, and thanks, guys. We definitely got uh, got some good questions going there. So moving into our Cahoots quiz round, we're going to find out exactly how much uh, everyone was paying attention. So in uh, using your smartphone, if everyone can please go to the uh, website that, that is showing on the screen, www.cahoot.it. So this will allow you to log into the game. You don't have to download any apps or anything. It's quick and easy. So 
everyone can slowly start bringing that up. Um, so the in the next little while, I'm going to have a screen that's going to show you a game pin. If you can just enter that pin, it'll get you connected to our game. You'll also need to enter your email address, basically just so we know who you are and that if you finish within the top three, we can email you your prize. Uh, everyone will also need to pick a nickname. Please keep in mind that uh, this is work function, so keep your HR department in mind and uh, don't use anything that you're going to regret. And the faster you answer each question, as long as it's correct, the more points you will earn. So it is definitely a, a little bit of a game of speed. So our prizes that we have today, uh, the first place winner will be receiving a $150 Amazon gift card, second place $100, and third place $50. So uh, hopefully that's enough to uh, motivate everybody today. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the pin for everyone. So there is our pin on the screen there, 4666562, if I can get everybody to start logging in. Players logged in already. We'll uh, give you guys another few seconds to get logged in here. As always, some interesting nicknames. Batman, really? <laughs> Okay, let's get started. So our first question, CO2 trapped in the atmosphere creates what is known as global warming potential. CO2 acts as a blank around the earth. Remember the fastest answer that is correct will earn the most points. All right, we got 16 correct answers on that one. Oh, and Liam in first place, who I think was our, uh, our last participant that just snuck in there. Okay, so true or false, embodied carbon is the emissions from manufacturing, transportation, installation, and the use of the building. All right, 17 right on that one. Oh, and Concrete for Life takes the lead. Okay, the two largest contributors to global warming potential by division are blank and blank. Ooh, that was a little bit of a tricky one. And Concrete for Life still in the lead. Lowering embodied carbon in materials requires consideration in the blank stages of design. Well, that's a quick one. All right. Oh, and we have a new leader, EM. Although cement compromises only 7 to 15 percent of concrete's volume, it is responsible for approximately blank percent of carbon emissions. Okay, 12 correct answers. And a new leader, ABC. Keep switching it up. Which one of the following helps to reduce embodied carbon in concrete? Mm 
don't get that one right here. Had to throw in an all of the above there. That always messes everybody up. And all of the above it is. Hey, ABC is holding on to the top spot. And number seven. What are the two categories of admixtures that can reduce embodied carbon in concrete? Okay, water reducing and strength enhancing. Wow, everybody got that one. And ABC is holding on to it. True or false? Carbon offset is needed to attain net zero embodied carbon in concrete. It is costly and very hard to reach this goal. Okay. And Mike S takes the lead. Second last question. Market driven goals for lower embodied carbon are being developed by owners, blank, and engineers. And architects was the correct answer there. And ABC is back in the top spot. Last question. You have to type the answer for this one, so be ready for it. Shift from perspective to blank. Basic specifications is key to support development of low embodied carbon concrete. Okay, I've got a few seconds left to type in that answer. So some of the answers we got here, and the correct one is performance. So our final results are in third place, we have Liam. Luckily you snuck in there, Liam. In second place, we have Concrete for Life. And in first place, everyone was fighting for that top spot. ABC held on to it. All right, and uh, runners, runners up were XYC and Father Time. So good job, everybody. Thanks for playing. It's always nice to uh, have a little bit of an interactive component when it comes to these things. So I'm just going to finish up with our PowerPoint here. So that was an excellent presentation today. We do have another uh, associate member webinar coming up in April, April 15th, same time, 10 to 11 a.m. Uh, we will have Euclid Chemical joining us. Uh, they will be presenting their webinar on concrete construction using shrinkage additives and reduction of carbon footprint with fiber reinforcement. So hopefully many of you will be able to join us then. Um, other than that, uh, it was great to have everyone join us on this cloudy, rainy, almost spring day. Hopefully everyone enjoyed the opportunity to step away from their day-to-day -day work and connect with some others in the industry. I'd like to thank David and Shervan again for taking the time to put this presentation together for us. They have definitely shared some interesting and valuable industry information. I think the uh, sustainability and carbon topics are, are a huge, uh, huge area of interest for our industry, especially today. Uh, and we hope to see you all at our next webinar. So stay healthy and safe, everyone. Thank you for joining us.